let's learn about sufficient statistics and the factorization theorem. First, let's make sure we are on the same page about some terminology. What is a statistic? A statistic is a function of data. Simply, it is something that is calculated from the data. We might write that a statistic t is a function of our vector of data x, or we might write that it's a function of all of our data points from the first data point to the nth data point. Uh, those both mean the same thing. Uh, a statistic describes the sample of data. So some examples are the sample mean, the sample maximum, the sample standard deviation, anything that is calculated from the data. Uh, one way to remember is that a statistic describes the sample. They both start with s. What is a parameter? A parameter describes the population. Again, we have this alliteration, p, p. Parameter describes the population. Parameters are often denoted by Greek letters like theta, lambda, mu, sigma. And in statistics, the parameters are unknown, and we want to estimate them. So for example, we, we might not know the population mean, so we want to estimate what it is. And we use a statistic to estimate the parameter. And what does it mean for a statistic to be sufficient? Well, let's think about what the word sufficient means in general. Sufficient means enough to achieve a goal. Well, our goal is to estimate the parameter. So a sufficient statistic is enough to achieve our goal of estimating the parameter. The sample mean x bar is often sufficient for estimating the population mean mu. The sample proportion p hat is often sufficient for estimating the population proportion p. And the number of events that occur in a time period is often sufficient for estimating the rate at which the events occur. So if we remember one thing from this video, let's remember that when we see some statistics paper talking about a sufficient statistic, all they mean is that we are taking the important aspect of the data that helps us learn about the parameters, that helps us learn about the population. That's what a sufficient statistic is. So what is not sufficient? Well, for example, if I want to learn about the mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution, then the sample mean is not sufficient for learning about both, because I also need to have the sample standard deviation. The sample mean tells me nothing about the standard deviation, so it's not sufficient. It's not enough to teach me about the standard deviation, because it's just about the mean. Okay, now let's actually start learning the math behind sufficient statistics. So first we want to consider a joint probability density function. So we'll be considering the joint density, which describes the probability of seeing a certain set of data that our random variable x1 takes a certain value, that x2 takes a certain value, and that xn takes a certain value, that all of our data takes a certain value. Now, assuming our data is independent and identically distributed, the joint density function is the product of the individual densities. So we could say that the joint density of our vector of data x is simply the product of the individual densities. So for example, suppose that we flip a coin 10 times and we repeat this process three times. So that means we're flipping the coin 30 times in all in groups of 10. What is the probability that we see five heads in the first set of 10 flips, then seven heads in the second set of 10 flips, and then four heads in the third set of 10 flips? Well, the probability of this is simply the probability of these three uh, events multiplied by each other. Okay, so we might recognize the binomial distribution here. This is the probability of getting five heads in the first 10 flips, of getting seven heads in the next 10 flips, and of getting four heads in the next 10 flips. Now, in statistics, we will usually not know these numbers. We will not know that we have a coin that is 50-50. We will want to learn about the probability of success. So those will just be thetas, right? They'll be an unknown parameter that we do not know. Now, the factorization theorem tells us how can we find a sufficient statistic. And we say that a statistic t of x is sufficient for a parameter theta if we can factor the joint density into two parts. One part involving our statistic t and our parameter theta, and another part just involving x but no thetas at all. Now I'm writing this as a conditional density here. Okay, we have a conditional sign. But mathematically, it doesn't have to be an actual conditional density function. Uh, so we could write it with a comma. We could write it like this with subscript notation. Uh, the important thing is that this part of the function just involves t and theta, and not x in any other way. Now, the factorization theorem is the way that we usually prove sufficiency, but often the definition of sufficiency is introduced in another way. We say that a statistic t of x is sufficient for theta 
if the conditional density, the density of our data, given our statistic, does not depend on theta. And let's think about this with our definition of sufficiency. We said a statistic is sufficient if it's enough to tell us about theta. So what we're saying is, if I know t of x, then that basically tells me about theta. And that means that my distribution of my data doesn't depend on theta because I already know everything I know because of the statistic. Now, if the data has a joint probability density function, then the above definition is actually the same as the factorization theorem. So we're just going to prove it using the factorization theorem because it's usually much easier. And every distribution that we've ever heard of has a density function. So for the vast majority of cases, uh, except for very advanced situations, we can just prove sufficiency using the factorization theorem. Now, why might I care about sufficiency? Sufficiency is important in maximum likelihood estimation. Suppose a statistic is sufficient, right? Then we said by the factorization theorem, we can write the density like this. And in maximum likelihood estimation, we estimate theta by trying to maximize f of x. In maximum likelihood estimation, we'll often write the function not as a function of x, but as a function of theta, but it's still the same function here that we are trying to maximize. And we're trying to choose the value of theta that maximizes this function. Well, if we're trying to choose the value of theta, then that only involves the function g, and it does not involve the function h, which means theta only interacts with the data through the sufficient statistic t, and nothing else about our data will matter. Okay, so our statistic tells us everything we need to know about the value of theta that we'll find. It's also important in Bayesian estimation. So in Bayesian statistics, we're trying to find a posterior distribution of our parameter, f of theta given x. Uh, in Bayesian statistics, we often uh, use the proportionality sign because things involving only x do not really matter for learning about the parameter. So we say that our posterior is proportional to our likelihood times our prior. And we've said that because t of x is sufficient, we can rewrite this using the factorization theorem. We can rewrite the likelihood function. And in Bayesian statistics, again, we can ignore parts of the equation that don't involve theta. So again, this h of x does not matter. And now, how do we update our belief about the parameter theta? How is it updated based on the data? Well, it's only updated through the value of our statistic. So if I can prove that a thing like x bar is sufficient for a parameter mu, well, then I only need to know the sample mean to update my belief about mu. I don't need to know anything else about the data, and this is very useful for us. So the posterior distribution only depends on the data through our sufficient statistic. And one more reason we care about sufficiency is there are theorems like the Rao Blackwell theorem and the Lehman Shafay theorem that tell us that the best estimators we can make are based on sufficient statistics. So for example, when estimating the probability of success, we can prove that the best possible estimator must be a function of the number of successes. Okay, now let's actually prove a statistic is sufficient using the factorization theorem. So again, this is our definition of the factorization theorem, and we say that a statistic is sufficient if we can factor it into these two parts. And our strategy for this is going to be to separate the x's and the thetas as much as possible. Drag the thetas to the left while leaving as many x to the right as possible. And any x's remaining on the left will be our sufficient statistic. So we have a Poisson distribution. Uh, we say if events occur at an average rate of lambda, okay, so lambda is our theta, right? Lambda is our parameter here. Then the probability of seeing x events in that time period is simply e to the negative lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial. So the probability of seeing a certain number of events, x1, in the first time period, x2 events in the second time period, and xn events in the nth time period is this. We multiply all of the PDFs for Poisson by each other, and we get the product of a bunch of Poisson PDFs. That's our joint PDF. And we can algebraically simplify this equation and see that it simplifies to this form. Now, again, our strategy is going to be to drag the thetas, which in our case is the lambdas, to the left. Okay, so we're going to take everything that involves a lambda and drag it to the left while leaving as many x's to the right as possible. So here, we've done that. We've taken our lambdas to the left. We've tried to keep as many x's to the right as possible, but this x here is not separable from this lambda. So any x's remaining to the left make up the sufficient statistic. 
So here, our sufficient statistic is the sum of the xi, which is the total number of events that occurred. If I know the number of events that occurred, that is sufficient for telling me about the rate at which events occur for a Poisson distribution. We see here that we have our function of t of x and theta, or in our case, lambda, right? This is only a function of lambda and t and not x in any other way except for this being a function of x. And then we have the part that is h of x, which only involves x and does not involve our parameter lambda. So if I know the total number of events that occurred in the end time periods, it makes sense that I can compute the average rate. For example, if I know that 15 events occurred in three hours, I can compute that the average rate is five per hour. Sufficient statistics are not unique. The sum of the xi is sufficient for lambda, the total number of events, but also the average number of events x bar is also sufficient for lambda. If I know that 15 events occurred in three hours, or if five events occurred on average per hour, these both tell me everything I need to know to estimate the average rate lambda, which I think is around five. Let's do another example with the binomial. So we want the probability of observing a certain number of successes in the first N1 trials, a certain number of successes in the next N2 trials, and a certain number of successes in the final N3 trials. This is the example we saw earlier and we can write the joint probability density function like this. And again, our strategy is to drag the thetas to the left while leaving as many x to the right as possible. So I wanna take all of these thetas and drag them to the left, okay? So I've done that here. I've dragged them to the left while leaving as many x's to the right as possible. And now I can do some algebraic simplification to gather together all of these thetas and to drag together all of these one minus thetas. And again, I have the x's here without any thetas to the right. So we see this x1 plus x2 plus x3 occur in both of the exponents of the theta and one minus theta. And those are not separable from the theta. There's no way to factor that out. So I'm gonna let that be my t of x. So let's call that t. And now we see the factorization theorem in action. I have my thetas, I have my t, and I have no other x's here. And then over here, I have my x's with no thetas. So I've factored this according to the factorization theorem, which tells me that t is sufficient. Why is t sufficient? Why is the sum of the xi sufficient? Well, that's just the number of successes that we saw. And if I know the number of successes, that tells me everything about the probability of success. I don't need to know about the order of what occurred or how the successes and failures were distributed among the various trials. I just need to know the number of successes to tell me the probability of success. Here's a practical example of this in action. One way that I could see binomial success failure data is to observe six separate trials. This is observing all of the information of what happened. I saw a success, then a success, then a success, and then three failures in a row. Now, I could also get some summary data of three repetitions of two trials. And I could be told that in the first two trials, they were both successes. In the second two trials, there was one failure and one success, but we don't know which order they occurred in. We just know that there was one of each and that there were then two failures. So this is a little less information than here. Or I could observe all six trials at once and just know that I got three failures, three successes, and I have no idea which order they occurred in. But because we said knowing the number of successes is sufficient, this detailed information gives me the same information as the summary information. That's what it means to be sufficient, that we don't need to know all of the details. We can just know the summary statistic. So in summary, a statistic, t of x, is sufficient for a parameter if we can factor it according to the factorization theorem into a part involving t and the parameter and another part in just involving x. And an equivalent definition is that t of x is sufficient for theta if the conditional density of x given our statistic does not depend on theta. Remember that the factorization strategy is that we want to drag all of the thetas to the left while we're leaving as many x to the right as possible and any x's remaining will make the sufficient statistic. And any x's remaining to the left will make up our sufficient statistic. Sufficient statistics tell us what is important about the data, the parts of the data that are sufficient for learning about the parameter, 
and common estimators in statistics like the maximum likelihood estimate or the Bayesian estimate must be based on sufficient statistics. We can prove that in some sense, estimators based on a sufficient statistic are the best possible estimators we could find. That's the end. Please like and subscribe for more statistics videos.